Hi everybody, and welcome to our talk on social modeling via logic programming in City of Gangsters. Uh, my name is Rob Zubek and, uh, of SOMASIM, and this is a paper we wrote with Ian Horswell of Northwestern University, Ethan Robison of Naughty Dog, and Matthew Vione of SOMASIM as well. Uh, and this is a talk for the AI and Interactive Digital Entertainment Conference 2021. The link to the paper itself is below in the description uh, section on the YouTube video. Please check it out. Uh, and uh, in this talk, we will talk about, well, uh, our game City of Gangsters, the social modeling uh, challenges that we ran into and how we used logic programming for that. So uh, let's jump right into it. City of Gangsters is a mafia management game. Uh, the year is 1920, uh, the beginning of prohibition in the United States, and uh, instantly everything uh, related to the uh, production and distribution of uh, alcohol became illegal in the United States, uh, thus pushing a fifth of the entire economy into the underground, basically, turning it into a black market. Uh, so this is a game where the player finds themselves as a new arrival in a big city at the beginning of Prohibition, tasked with the goal of making a name for themselves and becoming a successful entrepreneur. It's a proc procedurally generated tycoon game. Uh, everything about the city uh, changes with every run. Uh, uh, your opportunities will change. This layout of the city itself will change. Um, and the uh, we had four pillars uh, that we really rested on, uh, that we wanted the design of the game to rest on. Uh, the first one is that it's a simulation of organized crime as a business. What would it be like to run the mafia uh, from a business point of view? You have to worry a lot about production and distribution and logistics and that kind of stuff. Uh, related to this pillar number two is that what we call a you gotta know a guy uh, mechanic, which is that uh, this is the prohibition everything you do is illegal so you have to uh know somebody who can trust you who, who can get you in on deals who will buy stuff from you and so on you can just you cannot just go out and uh operate in the in the free market three uh because everything you do is uh, uh being done in the con in the social context um what you do will have consequences and will reverberate through the social network. We call it the wolves have ears kind of a setup, where uh, if you do something good by somebody else, uh, they will tell their family, they will tell people they know, and other people will react to things that you've done, even though you have not maybe even met them. And four, uh, this is a kind of a 4X game, uh, so, you know, explore, explore, expand and so on uh, and your goal is to keep growing and keep building your empire larger and larger which will naturally uh, cause you to r have run-ins with other AIs and, and other entities that are vying for the same resources. We, we really wanted the relationships to be uh, central to have uh, kind of like social norms embedded into them so that for example if you uh, hurt somebody then it will impact your relationships to their friends and family uh they affects like an eye for an eye right like if you if you go and attack somebody then the people who are their friends will you know have it out for you um or vice versa like you help my brother kind of a thing like hey you go and help somebody and now their family will do stuff for you because you you did right by them so everything you do in the city exists within a network of relationships. Uh, everybody that you interact with has friends and family. Everybody uh, knows some other people so that when you do something, um, it, it has a network through which to reverberate. Uh, in order to generate this kind of a social network, uh, we start by actually, we start 50 years earlier in 1870. We simulate the growth of a city and uh, we forward simulate uh, people's lives uh, through those years, through through five decades, um, births, deaths, marriages, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then we end up with a city that has about a thousand, maybe more, 1,200, 1,500, and so on, interactive NPCs who all have interesting inter uh, relationships with each, with maybe not everybody, but with some people in their neighborhood and their family and so on. And then we drop the player in the middle of it, and then uh, the player has a very interesting sub social uh, uh, substrate with which to work. Since we had these kinds of complex uh, social networks and histories of what happened between people, uh, we wanted to implement social norms, such as uh, an eye for an eye, or uh, uh, I will help you because you help my brother, uh, through uh, in kind of some kind of an abstract way. And uh, logic programming uh, was a natural fit. Uh, and in terms of implementation, uh, we turned to uh, logic programming system. So we started with Unity Prolog, and then we switched to Ian's uh, bottle system, which had excellent performance characteristics. Um, the uh, Specifically what we were looking for 
was a very fast execution time and a minimum memory allocation because we do have enormous cities. We have cities with a thousand plus NPCs and the player can go and interact with any of them in any kind of a possible way. So the inference has to be able to uh, uh, take care of any kind of uh, uh, inferences basically uh, between any of these entities um, at any given time. So performance was incredibly important. And how does the battle system achieve this kind of performance? Uh, let me turn this over to Ian who will tell you all about it. Hi, I'm Ian Horswell. I'm going to talk about Bottle, which is the logic programming engine used in City of Gangsters. It's basically a prologue subset, and its uh, main claims to fame are that it's very fast, and it has some nice features for integrating with a game engine in particular. It uses the underlying C-sharp object system, which makes it easy to call into the native game code and access its data structures. We were operating under some pretty serious design constraints in building the system, I wanted to use it for an undergrad class on large-scale social simulation, and so it had to be usable by sophomores um, without enormous amounts of time spent teaching logic programming, needed to support very large numbers of NPCs, and in City of Gangsters it ends up supporting over a thousand. We needed to, again, use the underlying C-sharp object system, and in order for Rob to be able to use it, I had to promise never ever to trigger a GC. So the last two of those give us a design trade-off. Prolog-like languages can be completely stack allocated because any time you backtrack, you can just reset the stacks. So that's great. That means you never GC. So we can do that. And we can use the underlying C-sharp object system. And we can support unification of arbitrary tree structures but you can't do all three at once. You get to do any two. And so we gave up on unifying arbitrary tree structures. And so the unifier is basically unifying objects that are, as far as it's concerned, atomic, even if they happen to be things like arrays. So that means that bottle is missing some sort of classic prologue things. We don't have function symbols. We can't write patterns that match arbitrary tree structures. That in turn means we can't write higher order predicates that take an abstract syntax tree for other bottle code at runtime and pattern match it and do cool things with it. Instead, we have to put up with compile time macros that do a compile time expansion into first order code. Um, and mostly that, that works for us. There's a lot of performance engineering that goes into that. Um, we do pure stack allocation of everything. So whenever we backtrack, we pop the stacks. That's great, it means we don't garbage collect. However, it um, we have serious restrictions on what C-sharp will allow us to stack allocate. So we end up having to allocate a lot of things as arrays and manage those as stacks manually. The underlying C-sharp virtual machine wants to go and quietly move things onto the heap without talking to you. And in order to get around that, we have to use variant records for some of our data types. But the good news is that a byte compiled virtual machine turns out to be good enough. It's an exotic um, virtual machine, even by the standards of logic programming, but it's good enough. So classical logic programming compilers are mostly focused on how do we inline the process of unification because most of what a logic program is doing is unifying calls with one another. So typically the caller pushes their arguments to a predicate onto the stack, branches to the predicate, the predicate then has a bunch of different compiled rules that it tries one at a time, each of which attempts to match its patterns for its arguments against what's been pushed on the stack. That is typically done using the Warren Abstract Machine or WAM, which behaves exactly like I mentioned. We're doing something a little more exotic. We're using the Vienna Abstract Machine 2PC version or VAM2P, which actually executes instructions from the caller and the callee in lockstep. What does that mean? Well, let's suppose we have a predicate P of two arguments and we're trying to execute a query against it is P of three comma three true. The compiled version of the query is, hey, I'm calling P. 
my first argument will be 3 and my second argument will be 3. The first rule, let's say, is p of 1 comma 2. So p of 1, 2 is true. The system will execute the caller's push constant 3 instruction concurrently with the callee's match constant 1 instruction and immediately notice that those don't match and immediately fail this rule, moving on to the next rule, and then run push constant 3 in parallel with match constant 2, say 3 and 2 still don't match, and so we give up on this rule, move on to the third rule, which is p of x comma x. p is true of any x provided that we have the same x for both arguments, and so the way that works is we run push constant 3 all in parallel with match var first 1, which is saying I will accept anything for this argument, but it's being put inside of a variable that hasn't been used yet, but is going to be used in the future, so store it, and in particular store it as variable number 1. That succeeds, so we can go on to the second pair of instructions, which are push constant 3 and match it to previously stored variable number 1. Previously stored variable number 1, we just stored 3 into, so 3 over here matches 3 over here. That succeeds, and so we go on to this instruction, which says, hey, the call succeeded. So the architecture is a little bizarre. It's got two program counters, one for the caller and one for the callee, and the VM is actually fetching opcodes from both of them in parallel and then dispatching on opcode pairs, one from the caller, one from the callee, and that's the level of case analysis that it's doing. Anytime one of those pairs fails its matching operation, then the rule it's in fails. We reset the caller back to the beginning of its calling sequence and we move on to the next rule. All right, that's it. We have much more information about all of this in the paper link below. Unfortunately, we are out of time for this session. However, please check out the paper and we are looking forward to chatting with you in the Q&A session. Thank you very much.